My name is Duncan Large, and I'm the academic director of the British Centre for Literary Translation, which forms part of the School of Literature, Drama and Creative Writing at UEA in Norwich. BCLT was founded by the acclaimed writer and critic W.G. Max Zebalt in 1989. And this annual event, initially the St. Jerome Lecture, was renamed in his honour after his untimely death in 2001. Max Zebalt would have been 75 next May and will be marking that anniversary in a number of ways on campus. But for now, we're delighted to be able to continue our rewarding collaboration with the British Library and to host the Zebalt Lecture here at the Conference Centre once again for the fifth year in succession. BCLT is a research centre funded by the Faculty of Arts and Humanities at UEA. We coordinate research projects in literary translation. We run a lively programme of seminars, workshops and conferences, both on campus and internationally. We're also funded by Arts Council England through our close collaboration with their national portfolio organisation, Writers' Centre Norwich, who are co-sponsors for this evening's event. Over the last year, Writers' Centre have been engaged in a substantial capital project developing their headquarters at the beautiful 15th century Dragon Hall in Norwich. And later this month, they'll emerge from this chrysalis, excitingly transformed into the National Centre for Writing. BCLT collaborate with Writers' Centre on a number of programmes, including the International Summer School in Literary Translation and Creative Writing, held every year at the end of July, and the Zebat Lecture, where each year we invite a prominent cultural figure to speak about literary translation from their personal perspective. So it's my great pleasure and honour this evening to introduce to you this evening's Zebat lecturer, Arundhati Roy. Born in Shillong in northeast India, Arundhati Roy grew up in the south, in Kerala and Tamil Nadu. After training as an architect in Delhi, where she now lives, she wrote screenplays for film and TV and won the National Film Award for Best Screenplay in 1989 before achieving worldwide recognition for her debut novel, The God of Small Things, which won the Booker Prize in 1997 and has since been translated into more than 40 languages. It was followed by two decades of primarily non-fiction writing, a steady stream of polemical essays and journalistic pieces opposing global capitalism, calling out political oppression, passionately defending human rights and environmental causes. These have been collected in several volumes, including The Algebra of Infinite Justice, 2002, Field Notes on Democracy, Listening to Grasshoppers, 2009, and Capitalism, A Ghost Story, 2014. Arundhati Roy's many awards include the Lannan Foundation Cultural Freedom Prize in 2002, the 2011 Norman Mailer Prize for Distinguished Writing, and the 2015 Ambedkar Suda Award. Last year marked an eagerly anticipated return to fiction writing with the publication of her second novel, The Ministry of Utmost Happiness which was duly long-listed for the Man Booker Prize 2017 and the Women's Prize for Fiction 2018. Described by the Man Booker judges as a rich and vital book that has remarkable scale and extraordinary style and intelligence, the Ministry of Utmost Happiness is out this week in paperback in the UK. One of the central concerns of this marvellously kaleidoscopic work is language language variety, the politics of language, and translation between languages. Its publication confirmed our sense that Arundhati Roy would make an exceptional Zebat lecturer, and we were delighted when she accepted the invitation to speak this evening. After the lecture, my UEA colleague, Professor Andrew Cowan, will host a question and answer session. Then, at the end of the evening, you're invited to stay on and enjoy the cash bar in the foyer, where several of Arundhati Roy's books are available for purchase, and she's kindly agreed to hold a brief signing session. For now, though, can I invite you to join with me in welcoming Arundhati Roy to give the Zebat Lecture 2018, which has the title... In what language does rain fall over tormented cities? The weather underground in the Ministry of Utmost Happiness. Thank 
you for that introduction. Uh, when I was invited to do the Zebal lecture, I didn't think twice about saying yes, because somehow it was a subject that I had been thinking a lot about. And uh, well, fortunately or unfortunately, I think I fell into a rabbit hole and wrote about five lectures. <laughs> so I'm going to try and sort of speed through uh, what I've written and maybe it'll be published and you know, it, it, it might seem more coherent when you read it. Uh, obviously, you know, it seems uh, kind of mm, superficial to say wonderful things about W.G. Zebald because I haven't heard anything that's not wonderful about him. Uh, the, only, the only thing I'd say is that uh, perhaps the one place where we do disagree is, I, I believe this, um, this mo the, uh, today uh, his publisher, Simon Prosser and mine, told me he hated the word novel. Well, I love it. Maybe I am it. So for me, it's difficult to uh, almost think without telling stories. And I think this is a little bit of a story too, uh, this lecture. Um, so let me begin. At a book reading in Kolkata, about a week after my first novel, The God of Small Things, was published, a member of the audience stood up and asked in a tone that was distinctly hostile. Has any writer ever written a masterpiece in an alien language, in a language other than his mother tongue? I hadn't claimed to have written a masterpiece, nor to be a he, but nevertheless, <laughs> <laughs> but nevertheless I, I understood his anger towards me, a writer who lived in India, wrote in English, and who had attracted an absurd amount of attention. My answer to his question made him even angrier. Nabokov, I said, and he stormed out of the hall. <laughs> Only a few weeks after that incident, I was on a live TV uh, radio show in London, and the other guest was an English historian who, in reply to a question from the interviewer, composed a pain to British imperialism. Even you, he said, turning to me imperiously, the very fact that you write in English is a tribute to the British Empire. <laughs> Not being used to radio shows at the time, I stayed quiet for a while as a well-behaved, recently civilized savage <laughs> should. But then I sort of lost it. And I said that it was like telling the child of a raped parent that they were a tribute to their father's brutality. The historian looked hurt afterwards. And after the show, he said he had meant it as a compliment because he loved my book and asked him if he also felt that jazz and the blues and all of African-American writing and poetry were actually a tribute to slavery. <laughs> but notwithstanding my anger on both occasions, my responses were defensive reactions, not adequate answers, because both incidents touch on a range of incendiary questions, colonialism, nationalism, authenticity, elitism, nativism, caste and cultural identity, all jarring pressure points on the nervous system of any writer worth her salt. However, to reify language in the way both men had, in a sense, renders language speechless. What happens as it, when that happens, as it usually does in debates like these, what has actually been written ceases to matter. And that was what I found so hard to countenance. And yet I know and I knew that language is that most private and yet most public of things. And the challenges thrown at me were fair and square. And obviously since I'm still talking about them, I'm still thinking about them. The night of that reading in Kolkata city of my estranged father and of Kali, mother goddess with the long red tongue and many arms, I fell to wondering what my mother tongue actually was. What was and what is the politically correct, genetically apposite, and morally appropriate language in which I ought to think and write? It occurred to me that my mother was actually an alien with fewer arms than Kali perhaps, but many more tongues. And English is certainly one of them, 
my English that has been widened and deepened by the rhythms and cadences of my alien mother's other tongues. I say alien because there's not much that's organic about her. Her nation-shaped body was first violently assimilated and then violently dismembered by an imperial British quill. I also say alien because these days the violence unleashed in her name on those who do not wish to belong to her, Kashmiris for example, as well as on those who feel they do, Indian Muslims and Dalits for example, make her an extremely unmotherly mother. How many tongues does she have? Approximately 780, of which 22 are formally recognized by the Indian constitution, while another 38 are waiting for that status. And each of those has its own history of colonizing or being colonized. There are few pure victims and pure perpetrators. There's no national language, not yet, and the uh, Hindi and English are designated as official languages. And according to the constitution, which was written in 1950 in English, uh, English was supposed to cease to be an official language by 1965, 15 years after the constitution came into effect. But any serious move to making Hindi the national language is obviously uh, you know, ended in riots in non-Hindi-speaking uh, places. And so English has continued guiltily and unofficially and by default to consolidate its base. But guilt in this case is an unhelpful sentiment because India as a country, as a nation state, was a British idea. So the idea of English is as good or as bad as the idea of India itself. And writing or speaking in English it's not a tribute to the British Empire, as the imperial historian had tried to suggest, but it's a practical solution to the circumstances created by it. And fundamentally, India is still an empire held together on its edges by armed forces and administered from Delhi, which for most of her subjects is as distant as any foreign country. As things stand, in English, which is spoken by a small minority, which still numbers in the millions, is the language of mobility, of opportunity, of the courts, of the national press, the legal fraternity, science, engineering, and internationally known writers. It's the language of privilege and exclusion. It's also the language of emancipation and the language in which privilege has been most eloquently denounced. For example, by Dr. Ambedkar's Annihilation of Caste, which is the most widely read, widely translated, and devastating denunciation of the Hindu caste system. And it was written in English. Inspired by him, many Dalit, that is untouchable, formerly known as untouchable activists today, see the denial of a quality English education to the underprivileged as a continuation of the Brahmin tradition of denying education and empowerment to people who they consider belonging to the lower castes. And for this reason, in 2011, the Dalit scholar Chandrabhan Prasad built a village temple to the Dalit goddess of English. It's onto this mind-bending mosaic that the current Hindu nationalists ruling dispensation are trying to graft its one nation, one language, one religion vision. Since the 1920s, their call has been Hindi, Hindu, Hindustan. And it's an irony that all three words basically are based in Persian and Arabic <laughs> because uh, it, they are based from Al-Hind, which was the, the place that lay on the east of the Indus. Now, previously, Pakistan had tried to, to impose Urdu on its Bengali-speaking East Pakistan and it lost that half of its, itself. Sri Lanka tried to impose Sinhala, and you know it ended up in years and years of bloody civil war. All this to say we live and work and write in a complicated land where nothing is or ever will be settled, especially not the question of language or languages. Susan Sontag was surely aware of some of this complexity when she delivered this the WG Zebald lecture in 2002. 
Hers was called The World as India, Translation as a Passport within the Community of Literature. And what I'll talk about is translation as a writing strategy in a community without passports. 20 years after the publication of The God of Small Things, I finished writing my second novel, The Ministry of Utmost Happiness. Perhaps I shouldn't say this, but if a novel can have an enemy, then the enemy of this novel is the idea of one nation, one religion, one language. As I composed the cover page of my manuscript in place of the author's name, I was tempted to write, translated from the originals by Arundhati Roy. The Ministry is a, language, is a novel written in English, but imagined in several languages. And translation as a primary form of creation was central to the writing of it. And here I don't mean the translation of the inchoate and the prelingual into words, but regardless of which language and in whose mother tongue the ministry was written in, this particular narrative about these particular people in this particular universe would have had to have been imagined in several languages. It is a story that emerges out of an ocean of languages, a teeming ecosystem of living creatures, official language fish, unofficial dialect mollusks, and flashing shoals of word fish swim around, some friendly with each other, some openly hostile, and some outright carnivorous. But they are all nourished by what the ocean provides. And all of them, like the people in the ministry, have no choice but to coexist, to survive, and to try and understand each other. For them, translation is not high-end literary art performed by sophisticated polyglots. Translation is daily life, it's street activity, and it's increasingly becoming a necessary part of ordinary folks' survival kit. And so in this novel of many languages, it's not only the author, but the characters themselves who swim around in an ocean of exquisite imperfection, who constantly translate for and to each other, who constantly speak across languages, and who constantly realize that people who speak the same language are not necessarily the ones that understand each other best. The Ministry of Utmost Happiness is being translated into 46 languages, and each of those translators has had to grapple with the language that is infused with many languages, including, if, a, if I may coin a word, many kinds of Englishes. And I use the word infuse because I'm not speaking of a text that plays the Peter Sellers game of mocking Indian English, or one that contains a smattering of quotations of words in other languages as a trope, but of an attempt to actually create a companionship of languages. So after 46 translations, two are Urdu and Hindi. And just the fact that I use the words Urdu and Hindi separately, that I have to publish them as separate books with separate scripts is a story that is folded into the story of the ministry. But while I was working on the, with the Urdu and Hindi translators, I found that just because there are sections of the book that are set in Urdu speaking and Hindi speaking words, it didn't make the job of the translator any easier. For example, the human body, the physical human body, is a very important part in the book. And my Urdu translator and I discovered that it ha Urdu has no word for vagina. There are words, uh, obsolete words like the Arabic furj and other euphemisms that range in meaning from hidden part and breathing hole and vent <laughs> and path to the uterus. And the most commonly used one, aurat ki sharamgah, a woman's place of shame. As you can see, we had a problem on our hands. <laughs> but more than the post-writing translation, it's the pre-writing translation that I want to talk about today. None of it came from an elaborate pre-existing plan. I worked purely by instinct, and it was only while preparing for this lecture that I began to see how much it mattered to me to try and persuade language to shift around and make languages to shift around and make room for each other. But before we dive into the ocean of imperfection and get caught up in the eddies and whirlpools of our historic blood feuds, 
In order to give you a rough idea of the terrain, I want to quickly chart a route by which I arrived at my particular patch of the shoreline. So my mother is a Syrian Christian from the Malayalam-speaking south of Kerala. My father was a Bengali from Kolkata, which is where they met, the two of them. At the time, he was visiting from Assam, where he had a job as an assistant manager of a tea garden. The language they had in common was English. I was born in the Welsh Mission Hospital in the town of Shillong. Then it was a part of Assam. Now it's a part of the state of Meghalaya. And uh, the, the dominant tribe in Shillong are the Khasi. And it's interesting that the Khasi language was first transcribed by Welsh missionaries who were fighting their own battle against the tidal wave of English. So the Khasi language is written in what resembles Welsh orthography. Uh, the first two years of my life were spent in Assam. My parents' relationship had broken down, and I was farmed out to the plantation workers' quarters where I learned my first language, which my mother informs me was a kind of Hindi. But the workers, they, are, they were and are still basically from indigenous tribes of eastern and central India brought to Assam. And the language they speak is called Bagania. Bagan is like Chai Bagan, the tea estate. So it's a garden language, and it's a, it's a patois of Hindi, Assamese, and all their local Adivasi languages. So that was the first, Bagania was the first language I spoke. And uh, when I was less than three years old, when my parents separated, and my brother and I, and my mother and I moved to South India, first to Tamil Nadu, and then to Aymanam, which is the, the village where the god of small things is set. I soon forgot my Bagania. When I was five, my utterly, utterly moneyless mother started her own school. And I, in a little town close by, and I grew up on a di cultural diet that included Shakespeare, Kipling, Kadakali, which is a temple dance form, sound of music, as well as Malayalam and Tamil cinema. Before I reached my teenage years, I could recite long passages of Shakespeare, sing Christian hymns in that mournful Malayali way, <laughs> and mimic a cabaret from the Tamil film called Jesus, in which, which Mary Magdalene performs to seduce Jesus as a, at a cocktail party in <laughs> 0 BC, before things began to go badly wrong for both of them. <laughs> As her school grew more successful, my mother, anxious about my career, she banned my speaking of Malayalam. And she said that I had to speak only in English, even in my off time. And if I was ever caught speaking Malayalam, I had to write what she called imposition, which was like a thousand times, I will speak English, I will speak English, I will speak English, which I spent many afternoons doing until I learned to recycle my impositions. <laughs> At the age of 10, I went to a boarding school in Tamil Nadu, founded by Sir Henry Lawrence, British hero of the 1857 mutiny, who died defend defending the Lucknow residency. The motto of our school was never given, though most of our students believed that what he had actually said was never given to the Indian dogs. <laughs> and uh, the dogs part was cut out. Uh, <laughs> In, the bo in boarding school, in addition to Malayalam and English, I learned Hindi. But my Hindi teacher was a Malayali, so he sort of taught us <laughs> Hindi and Malayalam. And we really didn't know much Hindi. And so at the age of 16, I found myself on a train on a three-day and two-night journey to Delhi to join the School of Architecture, uh, uh, basically armed with one sentence of Hindi that somehow had stuck in my brain from a lesson called Swami Bhakt Kutia, which, which means the faithful, the faithful dog, you know? It was about this, do this bitch who had saved a baby from getting, getting killed by a snake by getting bitten herself. And the sentence that I remembered was, Subha utke dekha to kutia mari padi thi. Which meant that when I woke up in the morning, the bitch lay dead. And so for a long time in Delhi, I, I, anyone asked me anything in Hindi, I would say, Subha utke dekha kutia mari padi thi. And over the years, it's the slender foundation on which 
as my Malayalam became rusty, I built my Hindi vocabulary. <laughs> so the architecture school was full of obviously non-Hindi speaking people, you know, Malayalis, Tamilians, Nagas, Measles, Assamese, Kashmiri. Uh, my closest friend from Orissa who, who spoke no English or Hindi. And we just communicated with joints and drawings. <laughs> um, anyway, in a while we learned this Delhi University patois, you know, which is a mixture of Hindi and English. And that was the language of the first screenplay I wrote, which is called, in which Annie gives it those ones. And in giving it those ones uh, for us meant, you know, doing your usual numbers. So in the film, Annie, he's a fifth year student. He's failed four times in his final year. And his those ones is this thesis he has about very stoned thesis about how to solve the economy and rural urban migration by planting fruit trees on either side of the railway track because it's so fertile because everyone shits on the railway track. <laughs> so he keeps failing. Anyway, uh, so, so this film was made. It had no budget. It was like zero budget film. And our publicity brochure, it said, on the back, it said, you'll have to change the title because giving it those ones doesn't mean anything in English. Derek Malcolm of The Guardian waking up suddenly in the middle of the film. And underneath it said, well, obviously, Mr. Malcolm, in England, England you don't speak English anymore. Arundhati Roy later wishing she had thought of it earlier. And so the film won two national awards, uh, one for the best screenplay and the other, my favorite award of all time no booker could ever beat it. Best film in languages other than those specified in Schedule 8 of the Indian Constitution. <laughs> <laughs> in, in 2015, uh, we returned our national awards as part of a movement by writers and filmmakers who were protesting what we saw as the current government's complicity in the lynching uh, of Dalits and Muslims and the assassination of writers. So it didn't help because we've run out of national awards, but the lynching continues. But writing screenplays, I, uh, I wrote too, taught me to write dialogue and it taught me economy. But then I began to yearn for excess. I longed to write about the landscape of my childhood, about the people in Imanum, about the river that flowed through, through it, the trees that bent into it, the moon, the sky, the fish, the songs, the history house, and the unnamed terrors that lurked around. I couldn't bear the idea of writing something that began scene one, exterior day, river. I wanted to write a stubbornly visual but unfilmable book, and that book turned out to be The God of Small Things. I wrote it in English, but imagined it in English as well as Malayalam. The landscapes and languages colliding, and the seven-year-old twins, Estepan and Rahil's heads, turning, in, turning it into a thing of its own. So when their mother scolds them, Amu scolds them and says, if you ever disobey me in public, I'll send you somewhere where you learn to jolly well behave. It's the well that jumps out of them, at them, you know, the well that is in every house or every compound in Kerala almost. The well, the deep mossy well that has a bucket and a rope and children are told to stay away from. So what, what could a jolly well be? You know, <laughs> a, a well with happy people in it. But then how could there be people in a well? Well, they'd have to be dead. So it becomes a well full of laughing dead people into which children are sent to learn to jolly well behave. So the whole novel is constructed around people, young and old, English knowing, Malayalam knowing, all grappling, wrestling, dancing, and rejoicing in language. For me, or for any writer working in these parts, language can never be a given. It has to be made. It has to be cooked slow cooked. And it was only after writing The God of Small Things that I felt the blood in my veins flow more freely. It was an unimaginable relief to have finally found a language that tasted like mine, a language in which I could write the way I think, a language that freed me. But that relief didn't last long. As Esther Penn always knew, things can change in a day. And less than a few months after The God of Small Things was published, this new Hindu nationalist government came to power, and the first thing it did was a series of nuclear tests. And something convulsed, and something changed. It was 
about language again, not a writer's private language, but a country's public language, a country's public imagination of itself. Suddenly, things that would have been unthinkable to say in public became acceptable. Virile national pride flowed like noxious lava on the streets. And dismayed by the celebrations, even in the most unexpected quarters, I wrote my first political essay, The End of Imagination. My language changed too. It wasn't slow cooked. It wasn't secret novel writing language. It was quick and urgent and public. And it was straight up English. Reading the, rereading The End of Imagination, and it's all about that, you know, about the fact that the, having nuclear, uh, the idea of a nuclear bomb changes a nation's idea of itself. And, you know, so quoting bits from the essay, these are not just nuclear tests, they are nationalism tests, we are told. And, you know, this was the Hindu bomb, then Pakistan had the Muslim bomb, and all of that went on. But there was a paragraph in this, in this essay written 20 years ago where I said, why does it all seem so familiar? Because you could see the communal and the polarization coming at speed. And here, you know, the, the conflict, the Hindu India, the Muslims are not real citizens, and so on. And there was a paragraph here which said, why does it all seem so familiar? Is it because even as you watch, reality dissolves and seamlessly rushes forward into the silent black and white images from old films? This is referring to films on partition, you know? Scenes of people being hounded out of their lives, rounded up and herded into camps, of massacre, of mayhem, of endless columns, of broken people making their way to nowhere. Why is there no soundtrack? Why is the hall so quiet? Have I been seeing too many films? Am I mad or am I right? The mayhem came just in a few years after September 11, 2001. The Narendra Modi was sort of para-dropped into Gujarat as the chief minister, not as an elected chief minister, but as a chief minister who would deal with the climate that was prevailing in the world. And within a, a few months, you had an incident in, of arson in which a railway compartment was burnt with 68 Hindu pilgrims in it. Nobody still knows who set that coach on fire, and then there was what we have come to know as the 2002 Gujarat massacre, in which Muslims were slaughtered, raped, and burnt alive on the streets. Hundreds of thousands were pushed from their homes. It was not the first massacre that took place in India. Certainly, it was the first one that was telecast into our homes. So in a way, there was a soundtrack. And the end of imagination was the beginning of 20 years of essay writing for me as we watched mesmerized this um, religious fundamentalism and unbridled free market fundamentalism waltzed arm in arm like lovers, changing the landscape around us at speed. And you suddenly felt like you had these massive populations of uh, rural people being pushed out of their homes by dams, by mines, by roads, and pushed out of the cities because they weren't wanted there. And it was suddenly as though the city and the countryside had stopped being able to communicate with each other. It had nothing to do with language, but everything to do with translation. So you, you, you couldn't even explain to someone in the city what the result of this was. For example, to try and explain to a Supreme Court judge that for an indigenous person, land is not transactional. You cannot just translate land into money. And I actually got uh, hauled up for contempt of court and eventually went to jail. Uh, and the first thing they took objection to was my saying that to give an indigenous person cash compensation for his land is like paying for a, a Supreme Court judge his salary in fertilizer bags, <laughs> which they didn't like. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> But so over the years, these essays opened these secret worlds for me, and I met languages and stories and people that expanded me in ways I couldn't have imagined. And somewhere along the way, the slow cooking began again, and folks began to drop in on me. First, their visits were infrequent and more frequent, and then they just bloody moved in. And 
said, you better write about us, you know? So first there was Anjum, the Urdu speaker from Old Delhi. She, he, she came with her adopted daughter, Zainab, and a laconic, cloudy dog called Biru. A young man who called himself Saddam Hussein showed up on a white horse, who he introduced as Pyle. And he said that his real name was Dayachand, that he was a chamar, a skinner, belonging to the untouchable caste from a village called Jhajjar in Haryana. <laughs> and he spoke in a sort of Mewati, Rajasthani. He showed me a video that he always kept in his phone of the execution of Saddam Hussein of Iraq. And he admired the way Saddam Hussein had faced his death. And then my Saddam showed me, told a story about how his father had been beaten to death on the road by a Hindu mob and why he had converted to Islam. A real thin man with his right arm in a plaster cast and his sheet, shirt sleeve flapping at his side slid in like a shadow. And he introduced himself as Azad Bhartiya. And he said he was from Bihar. And he gave me his CV, which gave me his address and what he did. His, basically what he did was he was on a hunger fast for 11 years at Jantar Mantar for a new world. And his qualification, qualifications were MA Hindi, MA Urdu, first class first, BA History, BA Elementary course in Punjabi, MA Punjabi, ABF, which stood for appeared but failed, <laughs> PhD pending, Delhi University lecturer, Ghaziabad, uh, founder member of the Vishwa Samajwadi Sthapana, the People's World People's Forum and Indian Socialist Democratic Party against price rise. I offered him a cigarette. He went out to smoke it and returned only after a few weeks. That was the beginning of my relationship with him. <laughs> then came Biplop Das Gupta, the opposite of a drifter from the universe of English. And he was an elite intelligence officer. He came with his own expensive whiskey, which he drank steadily and borrowed my pen and started to write without asking me. And uh, every now and then looked up and started enunciating the Latin name of birds that he knew as I was trying to learn to spell them. And this created a big problem for me in the translations because, because you know, there, there aren't Latin names of birds in those languages. <laughs> um, then Tilotama and her lover Musa came, her Kashmiri lover, who seemed to know Hobart. And Tilotama put up a few sheets on my fridge, and they were the Kashmiri English alphabet. And it went like this, A, Azadi, Army, Allah, America, Attack, AK-47, B, BSF, Body, Blast, Bullet, Battalion, Barbed Wire, Border Cross, Booby Trap, Bunker, C, Cross Border, Crossfire, Camp, Civilian, Curfew, Crackdown, Cordon and Search, D, disappeared, defense spokesperson, double cross. He went on to cover the whole of the English alphabet all the way to Z. And I asked her what it was for, and she said it was to help innocent Indian tourists to communicate better with the locals when they went to Kashmir. <laughs> and, and, and clearly she was telling me that the, a military occupation creates a whole vocabulary of its own. Musa said nothing, he just melted into the surroundings. Then Tilotma's ex-husband, Naga, arrived pretending not to look for her. And he had this big medical file of his mother-in-law's medical reports full of oxygen charts and blood profiles. And I said, I, I'm not interested in strangers' blood profiles, you know? But then it was much later I saw that there were all these hallucinations from her hospital bed, and I learned that when you stare at people's hallucinations, they tell you more than real conversation ever can. Then there was this tall Sikh army officer who came in, Amrit Singh, just denying killings that I hadn't accused him of and saying that he, he was being made an escape goat. And then when he, when he picked up on the generally non-accusatory atmosphere, he began to boast about how, because he was a Punjabi speaking, See, he could actually masquerade in a counter inter, uh, in intelligence operation as a Hindu or a Sikh or a Pakistani militant. And then a baby girl arrived unaccompanied, and Anjum went and took her away. 
And then a hand-delivered letter, hand letter arrived from the forest of Buster. It was written in tiny, cramped handwriting, English, as far as I could tell, and addressed to Azad Bharatiya, who for some reason read it aloud to Anjum, translating it into Urdu on the fly. And this is the beginning of the letter. Dear Comrade Azad Bharatiya Garu, I'm writing this to you because in my three days' time in Jantar Mantar, I observed you carefully. And if anyone knows where my child is now, I think it might be you. I am a Telugu woman, and sorry I don't know Hindi. My English is not good also. Sorry for that. I'm Revati, working as a full-timer with the Communist Party of India, Maoist. When you will receive this letter, I will be already killed. My home became a commune and a confederacy of languages. And over time, we learned to talk to each other, to translate each other. The slow cooking recipe involved, the new slow cooking recipe involved considerable risk. I had to take the language of the god of small things and throw it off a very tall building and then go down using the stairs and gather up the shattered pieces. And so was born the Ministry of Utmost Happiness. It's not necessary for readers of the Ministry of Utmost Happiness to know or even understand the complicated map of languages that underpins it. If it were, if readers needed a field guide in order to properly understand this book, I'd consider myself a failure. To see it on a bookshop sitting side by side with pulp fiction and political thrillers gives me nothing but pleasure. The fun and games of the language map is only that, an extra layer of fun and games. In truth, the map of the Ministry of Utmost Happiness and their intertwining, the languages and their intertwining histories could become a rather large book in itself. So all I can do right now is to drill below the surface just the first couple of chapters to give you an idea. So I'll start with the opening sentence. She lived in the graveyard like a tree. So she is Anjum, who's middle-aged now and has left her home in the Khwabga, the House of Dreams, where she lived for years with a group of others like herself. And the first time you meet her, the first time she reveals something of herself to you, it's really at an intersection of two languages in which the traffic policeman is none other than William Shakespeare himself. So this is, the, this is a paragraph. Long ago, a man who knew English told her that her name written backwards in English spelt Majnu. In the English version of the story of Leila and Majnu, he said, Majnu was called Romeo and Leila was Juliet. She found that hilarious. You mean I've made a khichdi of their story, she asked. What will they do when they find that Leila may actually be Majnu and Romy was really Julie? The next time he saw her, the man who knew English said he'd made a mistake. Her name spelled backwards would be Mujna, which wasn't a name and meant nothing at all. To this, she said, it doesn't matter. I'm all of them. I'm Romy and Julie. I'm Leila and Majnu and Mujna. Why not? Who says my name is Anjum? I'm not Anjum. I'm Anjuman. I'm a mehfil. I'm a gathering of everybody and nobody, of everything and nothing. Is there anyone else you'd like to invite? Everyone's invited. The man who knew English said it was clever of her to come up with that one. He said he'd never have thought of it himself. She said, how could you have with your standard of Urdu? What do you think English makes you clever automatically? <laughs> so Anjum is born into this uh, Shia Muslim family in Old Delhi in the years soon after independence. And her father, Mulakat Ali, he traces their lineage back to Changiz Khan. And he's a Hakim, a doctor of herbal medicine, but really a lover of Persian and Urdu poetry. And he believes that poetry can cure everything. And he prescribes poetry to his patients like other doctors prescribe medicine. And uh, when Anjum is born, again, in the, you, you see, I mean, it, obviously the book goes backwards. And in the second chapter called the Khwabga, we witness Anjum's birth. And in addition to her mother and the midwife, her mother tongue is present too and found wanting. So you, you, the morning when the sun was up and the room was nice and warm, her mother, who, who was told by the midwife that she had had a son. So Jahara Begum, 
and swaddled little Aftab and explored his tiny body, eyes, nose, head, neck, armpits, fingers, toes, with unsated, unhurried delight. And that was when she discovered, nestling under his boy parts, a small, unformed, but undoubtedly girl part. Is it possible for a mother to be terrified of her own baby, Jahara Begum was? In Urdu, the only language she knew, all things, not just living things, but all things, carpets, clothes, books, pens, musical instruments, had a gender. Everything was masculine or feminine, man or woman, everything except her baby. Yes, of course, she knew there was a word for those like him, hijra, two words actually, hijra and kinner, but two words do not make a language. Was it possible to live outside language? To live outside language for a family whose lives are intricately and obsessively wrapped up in language is the crisis that Anjum's birth creates. And for the first few years, her mother keeps this secret from her father. But when she tells Mulakat Ali, her husband, Mulakat Ali, who, can, who has a poem from his huge repertoire of poetry for every single thing, for every minute change in political climate, for every crisis of love or anything, has no poem for his son or daughter. And that unmoors him completely. But, but when you first meet Mulakat Ali, he's, uh, he's actually a person who every few years entertains these shallow young journalists who are doing some exotic piece about exotic old Delhi, you know, where the Muslims live and the Muslim food and so on, for some, you know, newspaper. And he always, you know, receives them with grace and he tells them about his lineage and so on. And then he recites poetry for them. And so there's a part in this where you suddenly begin to understand the complexity of how, poet, how language was partitioned along with society, along with the land, you know. And, and I'll just read this little bit where uh, Mulakat Ali always welcomed visitors into his tiny rooms with the faded grace of a nobleman. And he spoke of the past with dignity, but never nostalgia. He often ended his interviews with the recitation of an Urdu couplet by one of his favorite poets, Mir Taki Mir. Jissir ko gurur aaj hai ya taj varika, kal uspe yahi shor hai phir noha garika, which means the head today which proudly flaunts a crown will tomorrow right here in lamentation drown. Most of his visitors, brash emissaries of a new ruling class, barely aware of their own youthful hubris, did not completely grasp the layered meaning of the couplet they'd been offered, like a snack to be washed down by a thimble-sized cup of thick, sweet tea. They understood it was a dirge for his own straightened circumstances, but what escaped them was that the couplet was a sly snack, a perfidious samosa, a warning wrapped in mourning, being offered with full humility by an erudite man who had absolute faith in his listeners' ignorance of Urdu, a language which, like most of those who spoke it, was gradually being ghettoized. So now there's a long part in this which I'm not going to read, but I'll just try and extemporize for you about how a language came to be partitioned. So Urdu, also known as Hindi and also known as Hindustani, were a single language written in the Arabic script. The base language was a language called Kariboli, and to which the Persian lexicon was added. So Kariboli is, was spoken in, a run, in and around Delhi, Meerut, these places. And it was, not, it was not the language of the elite, nor was it the language of ordinary people, but it was certainly a vernacular language born on the streets and bazaars of North India a uh, kind of lingua franca, a bit like what English is today in some ways. English and Hindi are in some ways. So um, it was the formal language of literature and poetry for both Hindus and Muslims, and it varied in ways from region to region. So the partition of Urdu into Hindi and Urdu began post the mutiny of 19. 57. I mean, trouble had started earlier, but in earnest it began in 19, 19, 
1857. So basically, after the mutiny, the Muslims were viewed by the British with great suspicion. So all the platelets of power began to shift. A kind of vacuum was created. Old resentments began to smoke through the cracks. And for the first time, the people who today call themselves Hindus, who never call themselves Hindus, they always refer to them by their own caste names. You know, I'm a Brahmin, I'm a Baniya, I'm a Jat, I'm whatever. But suddenly, you know, at the time when representative government rather than empire became the issue, people started, these whole feudal communities began to coalesce into constitutions. And they, the bigger your constituency, the bigger your leverage, the greater your leverage. So that was how people began to call themselves Hindus, all these, this whole lot of castes. And one of the biggest anxieties, which I've written about in another essay, was about the untouchables, who had then were about 45 million people, and who had been converting to Islam, to Sikhism, to Christianity, to escape. And now they were being view, sort of wooed back into the Hindu fold, and there was this great ceremony called Ghar Wapsi, meaning return home, where there'd be this kind of purification, and they would be told, oh, now you're Hindu, although the caste system was kept in place. So now when this whole new constituency is being created, there were certain markers, cultural markers, of how do you mark this community out. One was this Gharvapsi, the other was Gauraksha, which is cow protection, which is a huge issue today. I mean, people are being lynched and killed about it even today, but it began 150 years ago. So that was the cow protection, there was the return home, and then there was the campaign that Arabic and added the Arabic Persian script for Urdu not be the only script. And that there was a proposal that Devnagari, the script we know today as the Hindi script, be also accepted officially as a script. And finally, that campaign basically won its first battle in 1900 when the British agreed in, in a certain province that it could have two scripts. And the minute you had two scripts, of course, very soon you had two languages. The language mandarins moved in, and the upper caste Hindus started purging Persian from Urdu. On the other side, they were purging other vernacular tongues, and the scripts began, the languages began to drift apart. Actually, uh, the to, to campaign for a script to, as a popular movement, when you only had 2% of the population who was literate, it was really the elites who were, you know, jockeying for position. But, it, but that campaign was fused to this idea of Hindu nation, of cow protection, and so on. And eventually, it became two languages. And even the, the literary heritage was partitioned. Like the, the Hindi part left out all the beautiful Urdu poets. The Urdu part left out all the beautiful Bhakti poets, and you had a language partition, a people partition, and finally, of course, the land partitioned. And so that's why, you know, you had, of course, uh, the whole thing was resisted by writers because you had, you had a language like Sanskrit replacing local vernaculars. And Sanskrit was the language of ritual. Sanskrit was not a language used by human beings to describe human experience. It was not the language of labor or love, or yearning. It was the language of ritual. And so, in a way, it was impoverishing rather than enriching a language, which was a very peculiar thing for anyone to do. But writers, especially progressive writers, resisted this and continued to write the most beautiful uh, prose, uh, you know, dipping into all of this. Although now, you know, the official, uh, you know, textbooks and so on are going to cause that generation that has gone away to be unable to dip into it because the scripts are different, people can't read them anymore. So that's why when Mulakat Ali recites this couplet to his, his, his young people, they know that, he knows that they can't understand it. And, and so you have a situation now where you have this new Hindi, which is, uh, which is being promoted in India 
uh, Urdu is being, uh, you know, demoted. And recently, in fact, uh, people were like uh, in, in uh, two Muslim members of the Legislative Assembly of Uttar Pradesh, the home of Urdu, were prevented from taking their oath of office in Urdu. And one of them was charged with blasphemy. So although Hindi's victory has been a resounding one, the anxieties are still huge. You know, so you see Anjum in the ministry. She at one point is in Gujarat in 2002 when the massacre happens. And she has gone there with a friend of her father's to pay her respects at the grave of Wali Dakhani. He's a 17th century poet of love, the first poet to, to collect a diwan, which was the formal collection of Persian poetry in its formal way, you know, with all the formal requirements, the Masnavi, the uh, Marcia, the, uh, the Kasida. So, you know, these were the formal requirements of how you, how you deliver a collection. And Walid Akhani was the first, and therefore, in some ways, known as the father of Urdu poetry, because until then, high poetry was always written in Persian. And later, people started to write in Urdu. And when she went, now I'm talking about 2002, she's caught in Gujarat. And the, the mob destroys, and this is true, it happened, the mob destroys the grave of Wali Dakhani. And overnight, they build a road over it. So you can imagine how, how high the feelings run that a poet of 300 years ago still causes this kind of anxiety. So there's a passage in the ministry where you know all Anjum's friends at the Khwabga are looking at the TV, hoping to see some sight of her in a refugee camp or somewhere. And they learn that this grave has been desecrated. And they learned in passing that Wali Dakhani's shrine had been raised to the ground and a tarred road built over it, erasing every sign that it ever existed. But neither the police, nor the mobs, nor the chief minister could do anything about the people who continue to leave flowers in the middle of the new tarred road where the shrine used to be. When the flowers were crushed to paste under the wheels of fast cars, new flowers would appear. And what can anybody do about the connection between flower paste and poetry? I'll end this very long lecture with a very short note about slogans and mantras in the empire of India. Anjum survives the Gujarat massacre because the mob that finds her lying over the corpse of Zakir Mia, feigning death, believes that killing hijras brings bad luck. So instead of killing her, they stand over her and make her chant their slogans. Bharat Mata Ki Jai, Vande Matram. She did weeping, shaking, humiliated beyond her worst nightmare. Victory to Mother India. Salute the mother. Vande Matram, usually translated as Praise Be to Thee, Mother, is a poem written by the Bengali writer Bonkim Chandra Chatterjee, which appeared in Anand Mat, his story, his novel about the Sanyasi rebellion against the Muslims, published in the 1880s, a novel greatly favored by Hindu nationalists, both past and present, because it created a template for their fantasy Hindu warrior who rises in rebellion against his degenerate Muslim oppressors. So you, you, have, a, you, know, you have an Urdu poet who's, whose grave is desecrated. You have the mob chanting a Bengali poet in, you know, in their attack. So you know, the thing about slogans in the empire of India is extraordinary because you'll never normally find people chanting slogans in their mother tongue. In Kashmir, you don't find people chanting in Kashmiri because the slogans always calling out to someone else or to the outside world. So they'll chant Azadi, Azadi in Kashmir, which is in Urdu. Obviously, it's a slogan that came from the Iranian revolution. You know, uh, there's a very, anyway, I'll tell you that later, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so there are slogans in Persian, slogans in English, and slogans in Urdu. At the opposite end of the country, down south in Kerala, I grew up to the resounding roar of Inkalab Zindabad, long live the revolution, in Urdu. 
it's a, it's a, uh, it's a sort of doffing of the cap to Bhagat Singh, the martyr who was hanged by the British in 1931, he's a socialist in Punjab. The other Communist Party slogan in Kerala was Swadandriyam Janadhipatyam Socialism Zindabad. Freedom, democracy, socialism, long live. That's Sanskrit, Malayalam, English, and Urdu in a single <laughs> slogan. And now to end with a mantra. So when Anjum returns from the Khwabga after being in the refugee camps of Gujarat for a long time, she's very worried about this little girl, Zainab, who she's adopted after having seen what she's seen in Gujarat. So first of all, she has her cut her hair and puts her into boys' clothes because she's seen all this rape that happened. And then she teaches her a Sanskrit mantra, the Gayatri mantra, which all the Muslims in the refugee camp are saying, you should know to use in a mob situation to pretend that you're a Hindu. So the first time you hear the Gayatri mantra, this little Muslim girl who's playing with her dogs and her goat and walking down the streets, and she can chant the Gayatri mantra. The second time you hear the Gayatri mantra in the book is in a British Airways advertisement where they are trying to solicit customers for the new India, you know? So everybody's going around doing namaste and all that and doing the Gayatri mantra, uh, which basically, I'll just read the translation. It says, oh God, thou art the giver of life, remover of pain and sorrow, bestower of happiness, O creator of the universe, may we receive thy supreme sin-destroying light. May thou guide our intellect in the right direction. And the third time you hear the Gayatri Mantra is when uh, Zainab, Anjub's little daughter, has grown up and she actually gets betrothed to Saddam Hussein. And he takes them all to a mall in Delhi to have a meal. And then he tells them that this mall really stands on the ground where once his father was beaten to death. You know, and, and Zainab says, oh, I'll say a prayer for him. I know a Hindu, Hindu prayer. And she, in this fast food restaurant in a mall, recites the Gayatri Mantra. Such are the ways in which Sanskrit has finally been indigenized. A few months after she returns from the Gujarat massacre, unable to continue living her old life, Anju moves to the old graveyard where, as she gradually recovers, she builds the Jannat paradise guest house. When Saddam Hussein joins her, they expand their business to include funeral services. And the graveyard becomes a place where any body that has been denied the grace of a funeral by the dunya, the outside world, is given a dignified burial. Under the auspices of the Jannat guest house and funeral services, depending on what the occasion calls for, prayers for the dead include the reciting of the Fateha, the singing of the Hindi Internationale, and recitation from Shakespeare's Henry V in English. So how shall we answer Pablo Neruda's question that is the title of this lecture? In what language does rain fall over tormented cities? I'd say, without hesitation, in the language of translation. Thank you. was that? <laughs> uh, just to say, I'll ask a few questions and then I'll open the questions to the audience. We have a couple of mics, so if you have questions, um, you can start preparing them. <laughs> and then there's going to be a dance. Um, <laughs> Not me. <laughs> Thank you for that. It's great. It, it reminded me of... of your novel, actually, and it, the the uh, the urgency, the erudition, the humour, um, and it made me it made me think about um, well the bit I, it made me think about your process. The, the thing I liked the most, thing I loved, was the description of how uh, the book came to came about. That you found the characters were dropping in on you, 
And then they were visiting more and more often. Some of them actually moved in. And you had this confederacy of languages around your table. And some of them started to write stuff. Others actually turned up with documents already. It almost sounds like uh, transcription more than translation. Um, can you talk a bit, a bit more about your, your process, how writing happens for you? Well, both um, the, the, the very big, there's a very big difference almost in my body, you know, when I'm writing the nonfiction and when I'm writing fiction. Because the nonfiction is always something I almost don't want to write. And then at some point it becomes like just holding it inside me is too difficult. And so just, and when I, so there's a, there's an impatience and an urgency and an anger when I write it. And the fiction, uh, much to the annoyance of everybody, publishers, agents, everybody, there's, I'm in absolutely no hurry, you know? So, <laughs> and, and sometimes I just feel that, uh, uh, I mean, some of my friends are very impatient because it makes, I make it sound esoteric, but it is esoteric, you know, that, I just, I just have to wait, you know, and I just have to be open to it, and then it comes, you know, and it, it it's 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 very odd because I don't. It's not that I write a lot and then I discard a lot and I get a. It's it's I, I don't write a lot, but I'm clearly writing a lot in my head, you know. Mm -hmm. But when it comes on the page, it's 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 not very far from. Uh, what eventually is published. It's not exactly, but you know, there's a lot of, uh, so, so the, but there is that sense in which these people just come and crowd me out, you know? And the last couple of years, I, I live alone. And uh, you know, when people would come to visit me, I'd almost be like, you know, can you just behave yourselves, all of you? Like, can you, and, and I'd often be, telling myself, looking at this person and they're saying something and I can't really hear what the, the real person is saying. And I, I'm just telling myself, be normal. You know, just try and be normal. <laughs> and the minute they leave, all these people have opinions about that person, you know? Uh, and, and I have this sense that they are here now too. And they have opinions about people who have opinions about the book and all of that. I was going to ask about that, whether they're still around. So oh, yeah, they, they're not going the anywhere. Book, have you found a new home for them, or no, are they still no, no. here? They, they are around, and in fact, the people in the God of Small Things have also arrived, and Janet Guesthouse is, is doing well. And, and the, <laughs> are you receiving new visitors? Is there not, a yet, new book not yet, on the not yet, not yet, not yet, no. I should say that I'm a, a writer and a teacher of creative writing rather than a translator and a, a teacher of translation. So my understanding of translation is very much a layman's, and I, I, I think perhaps naively about translation in terms of, of borders and uh, crossings, liminalities, that word. Um, borders are very, very important to this book, and that, that um, figures uh, most profoundly in, in the figure of uh, Anjum. Um, as you described it there, uh, Anjum is, is born a boy, a much um, wanted boy, Aftab, um, and then translates himself into herself. Um, and I think you said somewhere else that there is an incendiary border of gender running through. Her, Her. but there are incendiary borders of some kind running through everybody and in the book. that's my question is. And, uh, and in fact, Anjum, you know, I mean, Often uh, people do ask a lot about her, but I always say this: that that's not the only thing that she is. You know, she's 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 also a Shia Muslim born in Delhi. That's today the more dangerous identity. You know, because obviously when she goes to Gujarat, she gets caught up in a massacre because she's a Muslim. She escapes because she's a Hijra, and they are worried about killing Hijras. But uh, she's also just a unique person in so many ways, a grand, raucous person, you know. But uh, Saddam Hussein has the border of caste and religious conversion. Another, I mean, as I said, something that's been coming since 
1857, like that is a dangerous border. Musa had the border of Kashmir running through him. Tilotama too has a border. And one of the characters we didn't speak much about, the one who just arrived with his whiskey and was writing his own stuff, he uh, also has a border running through him because he's, he, he's part the state, you know, part the person who can wait and put everything in perspective and not react emotionally and not react personally. And the other half of him is this thwarted lover who's failing, falling, mm -hmm. you know. So each of the characters has some kind of division in them. In, in a way which, which, uh, which is in a country where everybody lives in a grid of caste, of ethnicity, of language, of religion, of tiny, not even a grid, a mesh. Mm -hmm. You mentioned there um, a, a place, I think it's in, in Delhi, um, Janta Manta, mm -hmm. uh, which is a kind of gathering place of people with, um, um, with a cause. Um, with something they need to express, they gather there. They're many of them quite eccentric. Um, there's a it, it sort of resembles on a grand scale the Kwabka, where um, uh, Anjum lives initially, which is a gathering of, of um, people like uh, her. outsiders, yeah. people like her. Um, it also uh, resembles the um, the the hostel that she establishes in the old Muslim graveyard, which again becomes a magnet for all kinds of different people. Um, there's a way in which this, this book is um, a model for those places in that it's so very accommodating of it difference. Is, it is, I mean, I've always found, uh, you know, I mean, because I've been involved with a lot of these, these uh, movements and all of them do in some ways shelter a lot of eccentrics and nut jobs, you know, and there's something very <laughs> sweet about that. Even, uh, but un unfortunately, Jantar Mantar has been shut down by the government. People Completely. are not allowed to go there now and protest. And it's like suddenly one lung has collapsed, you know. It's just uh, uh, obviously the drive against every kind of dissent. And this is one of the things that happened. I, I feel it very keenly, actually, and very sadly, because I spent, I've spent many, many nights and days there. You know? yes. Is there another lung where people are able to? Well, the, they, are, they are now uh, told that they can gather in this place very close to Old Delhi, which is also in the book called the Ram Leela Ground. But you know, just to hire it, you have to pay 50,000 rupees. So firstly, you have to be quite rich to protest. You, know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you spoke earlier um, up here about um, finishing the God of Small Things. And, um, you had this huge sense of relief that you'd found um, a language that tasted like yours. I was very struck by that, that tasted like yours. And then the Hindu nationalist government started testing nuclear weapons, and that taste was soured for you. And you wrote um, an essay against that. It's called The End of Imagination, Imagination. Um, which I read on the train down, actually. Um, it's a very powerful polemic. It's, it's, it's a different voice. Um, it's still um, recognizably your voice, I think. It's the voice of the novelist still, but it's somewhat more singular. Um, can you talk a little bit about the relationship between uh, the artist and the activist? My most uh, unfavorite word is activist. Oh, sorry. <laughs> can you talk about the... <laughs> no, I'll tell you why. Because because I keep trying to think, when was this word born? The activist, that, that word. It's a very new and recent word. And why do writers who write politically, as they have done forever, and been beheaded and shot and killed and all that for, but suddenly writers seem to have been domesticated and so we need an extra profession to describe ourselves when we become political, you know? And I, I, I think that's a very, very important thing for us to remember because it reduces the idea of what a writer used to be. Um, but for me, uh, like I was saying, the, you know, the, the, the novel, the, maybe the reason why the novel is so much more, you know, as, as an act, as writing activity is 
more delightful for me is because the novel I see as, as, as a way of creating a universe and inviting the people you love to walk through it with you. Whereas the um, nonfiction, not all nonfiction, but my nonfiction has always been a very urgent in intervention in a situation that is rapidly closing down. So sometimes in the, when you see the nonfiction collected, you may not understand what the situation was at that moment. You know, the Supreme Court had lifted a stay or the government had ordered Operation Green Hunt, like a war in the forests against indigenous people or something urgent was happening. And the increasingly corporate uh, media is closing in with a consensus just, just despicable. And so I, I would write to blow that open, you know? Mm -hmm. But in fiction, there's always this, uh, this play and this whimsy and this ability to take your time and create create a universe. But again, when I started writing the ministry, I was I was aware that I I was no longer, or at least not no longer, but in in whatever I was thinking of, I could not write a conventional novel in which there were a few characters and there was a back. You know, there was I needed to, uh, and I did begin to think of the novel as a city, as something very much more complicated and with rules that needed to be broken and walls that needed to be moved. Would you say that the art itself is a form of <coughs> activism? That, um, oh dear, uh, if you, if you, <laughs> activism. <laughs> the book, I mean, it, it's, it's full of unspeakable horrors, except you, you speak them. Um, it's full of darkness, but it's carried by this huge generosity of spirit. It's capacious, it invites all people in. It's, um, you know, the thing is that um, there can never be, or there should not be only one kind of thing in a novel, you know? To me, a novel that was only full of horrors would be very tedious and a very sort of uh, simple way of looking at something, you know? so. As, as you saw, the, the idea is that there is so much that is beautiful, there's so much love and there's so much wicked humor and poetry and even in the people who are being crushed, there's still that smile before you go down, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, for me, that is what a novel can do. You know, that is what a novel can do. I mean, if you look at the section on Kashmir, in truth, I haven't written that much about Kashmir, but whatever I have said, I have said pretty simply, and that is why it has created an outroar when I speak. Often there's, you know, chanting and charges of sedition and all of that. Yeah. But I knew that really the, the only way I could write uh, what I thought about Kashmir was in fiction, in a novel, because it's not just a, chart of human rights abuses. Yeah. It's really about how people negotiate in those situations where you're living under an occupation. What are the negotiations, the collaborations, the subversions, the management techniques, you know, it's fascinating. Mm. So you hear from Garson Hobart, his point of view. You hear from Musa, you hear from Tilotama, you hear from all kinds of voices and stories and pamphlets that come out, you know? Yeah. And that, I feel, only a novel can do, and that too, an experimental novel. Mm -hmm. And it's a kind of refusal to give in to despair. If, if I think about the kinds of things you describe and then read about your involvement in various campaigns um, and try to imagine myself into those situations, I. I, I fear that I would give in to uh, despair and, and yet to write a novel about them. And such a kind of joyful novel um, is a form of activism. It's a form of riposte. He doesn't give up. <laughs> I like this word. I like this word more than yeah. you do. <laughs> you, uh, no, it's, you see, the thing is that if you're, um, I mean, I, I found this a lot, you know, that people who, looking, who look at what's going on, uh, you know, struggles that are happening and things from the outside, 
and who understand and are in solidarity are often quite despairing. But when you're inside them, mm. you know, it, it, it's not it's not so bleak because people know what they have to do and they do it, you know? Yeah. So, like, say you, you, you uh, go to Kashmir or you're in the, in the um, forest with the Maoists. I mean, I, or in the Narmada Valley, I've spent so much time laughing, you know? I mean, I remember one dawn, uh, we were walking, like, in the darkness, like, thousands of us, to capture a dam site, right? Like before, uh, so we, we were just supposed to just arrive at the dam site and take it over at dawn. And then the police came and all the women were, you know, arm in arm so that they couldn't isolate us. And the police were like beating up people and honestly, the only conversation that was going on was who was sleeping with who and who, <laughs> <laughs> you know? And honestly, it was like crazy, you know? Yeah. There's that too, which keeps people going. and. And uh, in Kashmir, on Indian Independence Day, everyone wishes each other happy slavery day, you know? <laughs> and I mean, this, there were, there's these stories about like the, you know, the remote villages, the border villages in Kashmir are, are obviously thinner populated and major army presence. But so, so they're really living under the boot. And so for them to protest is a big deal. So there's a huge protest in the city of Srinagar because a militant had been killed and a few villagers decided that they were also going to be protesting. And like I said, you know, the protests are always often in languages, the slogans are in languages that people don't understand. So a friend was telling me the story of this little group of villagers who were marching through the village shouting, Indian dogs go back. So they were being stalked by the army and the army caught hold of the stragglers and start to beat them up and sort of say, how dare you do this? And what were you saying? And he said, nahi sab, main to yehi keh ra tha ki Indian dogs yehi raho. Meaning, <laughs> he's saying that, no sir, I was just saying Indian dogs, please stay here. <laughs> so, cause he didn't know which part of it was insulting, you know. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> I know it's uh, right at the back that uh, we've been talking a little bit too long. Um, are there any questions for Aaron Dati from the floor? There's one arm up here. So. Oh. Hi. Um, so my question is, because you talked about um, language and translation, so my question is regarding memory because I wanted to ask your opinion on how you see memory navigating translation, especially between communities. And also, this is kind of regarded uh, in, in relation to creation of history, um, especially in a country like India, because it kind of dominates how we look at language being created. So, yeah. Well, that's a very, uh, it's a very good question, you know, and it requires a, a very long answer. <laughs> Because one of the things that is being manufactured in factories is memory now, you know? So we are manufacturing, you know, like people manufacture antique furniture. We are manufacturing antique memories, you know? So, so, so the, and, and it has been something that, that uh, societies that veer towards fascism and majoritarianism have always done, you know. So, of course, uh, uh, um, you know, as the Russians say, like the past is unreliable, you know. So you don't know, uh, and memory, and memory is, uh, and and for example, I can give you an example, like the whole protest that happened around this film called Padmavati, you know, which was. You know, people were actually uh, protesting about a past that did not exist, but it just didn't matter. You know, I mean, are you going to reason with them with footnotes when people are out with swords and wanting to burn down theater? So, so today, this is a very, very serious problem, you know, uh, that memory is being manufactured. So I'm down here. 
Thank you, that was, that was great. Um, could I ask you about the embodiment of language? Because like you said, language is not just words or sentences or Hindi and Urdu. Language is so much more. Language is what brings us into being as subjects of the empire, like you were saying. So what happens when you sort of embody that language? Because I think we in India are embodying that language of being a, a colonial or a neo-colonial subject, of being a Hindu, of being a Muslim. And is that where the problem lies? And the other thing was you spoke about the constitution of India and how it's written in English, that's another thing, but it's also written in the language of modernity. It is a colonial language of uh, development and protection. So what do you think is the place of minorities in the Indian constitution, minorities that Muslims or Adivasis or you know, the Dalits, and what does that mean for India today? Well, uh, <clears throat> You know, I think I think the, the again that's a profound question about about uh, language, and I sort of try to touch on it when 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 I when I talked about the fact that when you reify language, you know, when you make it into something like a cement block, then what is being said doesn't matter, or what is being written doesn't matter, and uh, I think the thing about language is that. Most often, language uses us, and then you have writers who use language. You know, so can does language bend you to its will, or you do you bend it to your will? I think that's kind of important to me, at least, uh, because when when the blood in my veins flows without stopping, it's when I know that I'm able to write what I think. And when I feel that I've not really managed to say exactly what I think, when the distance between language and thought is, is large, I'm uncomfortable, you know? Uh, but to a painter, that might not be the problem, it, or to a musician. Um, about the Indian constitution, you know, the thing is that uh, the, the, the architect of the Indian constitution was Dr. Ambedkar, who I mentioned. <clears throat> and he himself had huge, huge battles with the rest of the people on the committee. And he himself was unhappy with the constitution. He did want, um, want it to be rethought. But again, you know, like language, a constitution that is reified is also a problem. Anything that is verified. And so, but you have the problem today that the Indian constitution, when it was written, was in a way a much more liberal document than the society it was written for because of Ambedkar, you know, because of his caste and his understanding and his fears of what was going to happen when the Hindu elite took over from the British, you know, because. Uh, the British may have played into caste for their own good or their own reasons or their own advantage, but the Hindus believed in it, you know. So there was a real fear there. And he did work quite hard to make a constitution that was more liberal. But now today the, the, the Hindu nationalists have said that they want to rewrite the constitution uh, to make it a Hindu nation, you know. So, and then within the constitution, there are things which, <clears throat> which were also very hard on people. Like, for example, while it is liberal on, uh, more liberal than societies on caste, it was very illiberal for the Adivasis, for the indigenous people who were made, uh, uh, you know, the lands were taken away from them by the constitution and the uh, handed, you know, the, the, the state owned their lands and they were made squatters on their own land overnight. Then there were certain amendments to protect those rights, but those amendments are being vandalized by the government itself by selling land to big mining corporations and so on. And so often the most radical resistance groups are asking for the, complement, for the constitution to be implemented, for the government to just, just abide by the constitution, which is not happening, you know? So hand up in the middle. Uh, 
Thank you for your lecture tonight. The Booker Committee described your effort with adjectives of a style and elegance, and that was the fruit of your endeavor, which was God of Small Things. Move forward to a different chapter. Sitting in squelching boots and mud, fighting for the damn disposed individuals, fighting for the Dalits in the streets of India and even going to jail, requires brute force and resilience. How does the writer link style and elegance with brute force and, and resilience? Does that create a tormented soul? <laughs> You just, you just go to jail elegantly. <laughs> <laughs> it, would be, it would not be a, a, a great writer whose soul was not from time to time tormented or all the time tormented, you know? <laughs> so one is not looking for... Uh, I'm not the kind of writer, I mean, I actually get terrorized when people ask me whether I would like to retreat to some chalet in Switzerland to write. <laughs> I like, I'll kill myself, you know, I can't do that. So for me, uh, writing, uh, writing the way I do in, in the heart of chaos is absolutely fine, you know, and I, um, I think, I think that, uh, one thing, one thing that the mobs uh, who, are burn, who are desecrating the graves of 17th century poets, burning the homes of great singers like Rasulan by desecrating the grave of Fayyaz Khan, one of the greatest Hindustani classical vocalists ever, those mobs understand the danger of artists. And they have very good taste, <laughs> you know? So why we would never call Wali Dakhni an activist, or Fayyaz Khan an activist, or Rasulan, or any, you know, people who, who, who are alive in the world they live in, and who, I mean, it's so important for writers to be dangerous people, you know? People, people uh, and this is the great danger today, where writers are being placed in the marketplace and assessed by their value on bestseller lists. Whereas in India today, at a time when majoritarianism is, is taking over, where people are being brutalized, ghettoized, it is the time for the unpopular writer. It is the time for the writer who stands there alone and says, I denounce you. Fuck your bestseller lists, you know? <laughs> Thank you.